Hello students. Uh, this is Dr. Winkler again. We're on the verge of completing this course. I've uh, had a good time. I certainly have, have had a good time in presenting this information. Uh, this is the second lecture I would have normally given on the week of April 20th through the 23rd. I think the 23rd is the last day of this semester. So when we're done with this, your last assignment would simply mean would be taking the final. Uh, so uh, I, I hope that you are uh, enthusiastic about this. You're going to move on and take up some other good classes next semester. Right now, I was talking about medieval art. Uh, as much as I enjoy medieval art, it's, I, I'd be tempted to turn this into a medieval art class. Unfortunately, we can't do that, but we certainly can't talk about it. Last time I was discussing these issues, I was telling you about the magnificent churches you can see in a few places. These are wonderful Gothic cathedrals that you can see in various cities in Europe. <clears throat> Europe's expensive, as you know, but I urge you to, at some point, get the take the opportunity, if you can possibly manage it, to get over there. However, you don't have to go to Europe to get an idea of what medieval architecture is like. In other words, there are cathedrals that are built in the United States largely on the same model that we see in, in Europe. And uh, let's look right here. So I can get the highlight on right there. St. John the Divine is in New York City. As I recall, you take the subway up to 110th Street, walk over, and there it is. <clears throat> Largest Gothic cathedral in the world. It is absolutely huge. Um, one of the unfortunate things about the building itself, it's never been completed. Decades ago, I was taking a medieval art class. And the professor got up and said, it's not completed. It will never be completed. I go, what are you doing to me? Uh, of course it'll be completed. He says, you know what happens? Every time they get enough money to keep working on it, the prices have gone up. Well, I would like to think that some enormously wealthy people would uh, eventually make, make the... Uh, uh, Give, you enough, give them enough money to complete it. Uh, nonetheless, let's take a look at it, just ever so briefly. The, uh, this is the facade. Uh, see, it's not completed. It's supposed to have two towers. It only has one tower. Uh, you walk in here. I believe they want you to give a donation of $5, which I think is absolutely dirt cheap. And uh, on the interior, can you see from what I'm showing you? This is the Gothic arch. Um, so I can get a little bit broader view down farther here. And that would be another shot of the interior. Well, let's go down and look at these. Can you see in looking at this, this is actually not complete. Yes, we have a lot of marble. We have a lot of stone here. And there is one thing that, that I, I shouldn't say it disturbs me, but uh, there is a mixture of styles here. Notice, even though we have rib vaulting going up here, there are places where we do see the Gothic arch. Notice that this is more or less a Romanesque arch that does not really have the point. And we are seeing Roman columns down here. So we can say this to a certain extent. It is a mishmash of styles. Nonetheless, it is clearly a Gothic cathedral. Uh, isn't this fun? <clears throat> High altar, notice that along here, we do not have, we have the basic stone, but we, let's pull it out here so you can see it better without looking at me. So uh, this is not covered with this completed stone. Uh, what I say is we're seeing absolutely, by goodness gracious, if you ever get the opportunity to get to New York, uh, uh, go see this. It's really, really quite spectacular. Um, even though it's not entirely complete, uh, there's a lot of things to see there. There's a lot of stained glass windows that have been uh, completed. Off the sides, you have these small chapels, which are magnificent in their beauty. Uh, 
take it in. You might be interested in it. Also within New York City is St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, this is farther downtown. Don't remember the exact address, about Fifth Avenue. Any event, uh, the facade looks like this. It is very much Gothic in style. Yes, in comparing the size of this with that of the larger churches in Britain, uh, it's not quite as large. However, you do get a good sense of the Gothic. Notice you have, this is the nave. Notice you have the Gothic arch. You have rib vaulting. And I got a, on a tour once there, and a lady on the tour, giving us a tour guide, saying some of the stained glass windows were actually done by Tiffany and Company, one of the finer glass manufacturers anywhere in the United States. Okay, <clears throat> New York City, go see it. Uh, Washington, D.C. One of the big advantages of Washington, D.C. is the museums are free. And uh, New York City, go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You go to the Science Museum, you have to pay to get in. Go to, go to the uh, Science Museum in Washington, D.C. You also go to many other museums. You also go to the National Gallery of Art, they're free. So uh, as you look at your wallet, you might want to consider that, those as options. The Washington Cathedral is on the highest point within the Washington, D.C., within the city itself. And you can get a nice view up here. It looks down on the city. Uh, this is largely complete in the 1950s and 1960s. It is based on the English Gothic. It does not, uh, so we can say maybe the nave is a little bit longer, not quite as wide, perhaps. Notice this is completely Gothic. You have the Gothic arch, you have the rib vaulting, and over here you have really fun stained glass windows. I remember going in here and uh, walking in and saying, wow, what a magnificent Catholic church. Well, some Protestants, most of the Protestant religions, decided not to follow the artistic level of Catholicism because the all-important aspect here is the word of the Lord. You have art around you. You are distracted from what's being said from the word of the Lord, from the Scripture. Uh, however, the Church of England, which is the Episcopal Church in the United States, um, follows the artistic forms, which, there's a rose window, an artistic forms, which were very similar to Catholicism. So I was mistaken. I mean, the clue should have been when I walked in here, it is named the Washington Cathedral. <laughs> I guess the honored person was George Washington. I had to think about this a little bit. What religion was George Washington? Ah, he was Episcopal. So guess what? I'm in the Episcopal Church. Uh, magnificent building. I, was, I have a few stories. I used to go there a lot. It was kind of fun. It's free to get in. You walk in and look around. And If you go up in the elevators, you can actually get a look uh, across the building. And sometimes you can look at the external structures. It has a few flying buttresses. Uh, so they allow you to, to get around pretty good. Well, they have stained glass windows. You can kind of see a few of them here. On a lower level, there's stained glass windows. Can I show you that? Uh, no. Uh, they have stained glass windows. Uh, there's the choir right there. They have stained glass windows on the lower level. Well, I'm having a great time. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I never grew up. <clears throat> Don't grow up. There's nothing waiting for you there. You have all these things like jobs and responsibility. Be young. Enjoy it. In any event, uh, they had some of these stained glass windows on the lower level. Of course, I'm there, and you know, I got, you got to do it. I got my hand up, and it's blue light and red light, and playing with it with the light on my hand. And they invited me to leave. Well, their excuse was, "We're going to have a meeting in here a little while, and don't want to have you tourists around." I still wonder if I wasn't asked to leave because I was enjoying myself too much. And in any event, it didn't work because I came back the next day. Another example of medieval architecture, though this is not Gothic, this is essentially Byzantine, is the Basilica of the National Shrine in Washington, D.C. This is a Catholic cathedral, also built largely in the 1950s and 60s. 
when I was going to school in the Catholic University, it still was not done. The last time I was there, I think some of the alcoves they were working on back in the 70s have since been completed. Well, notice this is not this is not Gothic architecture. This is a dome, the dome they get from the Romans, and the Byzantines are still building domes. Remember when we talked about the Hagia Sophia, it is essentially a Roman dome. Well, let me tell you about this. Uh, the last year and a half when I went there to the Catholic University, my apartment was down here. First like, year and a half, I was still living in Virginia. So every time I came over to school, I came over to study, I drove. And there's, you can't see it right here, but there's a parking lot about right there. And uh, I guess I could have parked other places, but I didn't want to. You see, what I would do is I'd park right here. And the university, the, the classes and university buildings are back here. So I would just casually walk in one side, <laughs> you know, go up the nave, go to a few of the, the side areas, uh, uh, and walk out the door on the other side. Of course, when you come back to the parking lot, when you're done, you cut through here as well. Wonderful experience. I never got tired of doing this. I never got tired of the architecture. I never got tired of the magnificent materials, magnificent artwork that you can see inside of it. Notice it has a dome. Uh, these are mosaics up here. They're done in gold, as you can see. This is the high altar. And uh, give you, see, I can give you a, a few of the views of this. So, magnificent. Yes, go to Europe. If you can't afford it, in the meantime, until you save up enough money, uh, visit New York City, visit Washington, D.C., and there's uh, other places where they have good examples of Americans copying medieval architecture. Okay, let's go down to something not nearly as pleasant. Uh, I ask you to read an article and do a review on it about the persecution of Jews in the advance of the Black Death. Of course, this, this included advancing into Switzerland. Uh, I did that for the Swiss American Historical Society Review, so they wanted to focus on Switzerland. I did another much longer article focusing on Germany. But I decided, well, why give you that much information when I can give you a lot of the essential information in a shorter article? Can I say, therefore, you had an introduction into the crisis, and I probably ought to have that plural. I have crisis, it should be crises, should be plural in the 15th, 14th century, excuse me. And uh, it is a very, very difficult century. In fact, the 14th, and you can take it into the 15th century if you want to, are some of the most devastating time frames of the entire history of Europe. There's several reasons for this. Um, of course, the people during this time frame are very, very concerned about the Bible. and <clears throat> They uh, talk about the end of days, what's going to happen. There's a book called the Book of Revelations in which... The, John the Revelator spends time trying to give us an idea of what's going to happen in the end of days. End of days meaning obviously before the return of Jesus. And in Revelation 6, we see it, Revelation 6, 1 through 8, <clears throat> uh, John the Revelator tells us about some of the devastation. The four horsemen. The four horsemen have been depicted in art. Should we get something up here? Four horsemen. Uh, of the apocalypse. <clears throat> Whoa, this is a wood cut done by Durer. <clears throat> he, as you can see perhaps by his dates, he is <clears throat> late 15th century. Remember the 15th century is really tough. <clears throat> And you can see some pretty awful things happening here. Uh, essentially, we have conquest. We have war. I think conquest and war are very similar. Uh, can you see this guy right here? Looks like he could use a square meal. He's famine. <clears throat> can all these be indicated as a death? Sure. You got a man with a bow. <clears throat> this character. 
don't quite see what's in his hand. I thought he had a sword. <clears throat> in other, in, in in any event, uh, we're seeing a belief that a lot of people would be very easy to follow. That this is the end of days because of the enormous problems we have that's taking place at this time frame in European history. <clears throat> One of the ways we look at this and say this is quite a bad time frame is the 13th century is relatively good. Well, we can actually go back to the 12th century as well. Yeah, there are wars, but by the 11th century, the Vikings are out of the picture. In the 10th and 11th centuries, the Magyars are out of the picture. Uh, the Saracens have been pushed back. Yeah, we have fighting going on. We have these neighbors and we don't get along with each other. And the guy in this castle goes over and picks on this guy in the other castle. But we do really, relatively speaking, do have a very lengthy time of relative peace. In other words, not as much going on. So there's uh, more peace. Um, I have relatively good. In fact, to a certain extent, Europe is doing too good. Um, population is growing. It's growing dramatically almost everywhere. If you take floor plans, dot plan, of, of cities in the high Middle Ages, you'll find out that we have the city right here, and then a few decades later, you have to extend the walls. The city expands and it expands. It's very interesting in medieval Baron, for example. Medieval Baron is on the on the curve of a river. The, the river is the Aga, and uh, maybe I can show you better. And try to draw it in the air with my fingers. Okay. In the Middle Ages, can you get this right here? In the Middle Ages, you start out with Bern being essentially on this land. But over time, at one point, this is the city walls. As the population continues to expand, they move farther up the peninsula. This becomes the city wall. This becomes the city wall. It is obviously growing consistently and steadily in population. This is true in many other cities. Cologne in Germany is a good example. Um, then there is an issue, let's see if I have it down here or not. There's an issue of overpopulation. Problems loom. Okay, let's come down here. <clears throat> this is one of the problems that loom, that loom. Remember we talked about the medieval warm period, which we usually say runs from about 800 AD to about 1300. Remember I used that in context, we are talking about the Vikings. How do the Vikings move around so much? Well, there's a lot less ice and a lot easier to move. Medieval warm period, remember I mentioned that grapes, uh, which of course can be smashed into wine, is the preferred drink. If you drink water, it's a hardship. If you drink wine, it's very good. So people want to grow grapes. And they're growing grapes as far north as Norway. You can't do that anymore. It's too cold. In fact, I've been told you can't grow grapes in Britain either because it's still too cold there. This was not true in the medieval warm period. All right. Um, Gothic art. Talked about that. Brilliance. Brilliant. Technical advances. Didn't have a chance to do this. You can go back and look at the higher level, shall we say, a few pages up on this study guide, and you get a pretty good indication that a lot of things are going on, these technical advances. Relative peace, I've already mentioned that. Prosperity. All right. I talked about the advances in agricultural technology. I talked about the three-field system of crop rotation, which is superior to the two-field system. Um, I talked about better plows. I talked about non-choking collars, so the oxen or horses can actually do more work for you. But now people, shall we say, Europe's a washing people. You start to expand into the forests. Uh, forests have been around for centuries. Now you got to go and get more land. There are places in Europe which is very, very challenging. You see, you um, when you farm, you farm literally on the level, do you not? That's the best place. 
Uh, what if that's inadequate? Um, you start going up on hillsides. And it's hard to grow grain on a slope, isn't it? So what they do is they terrace the land. These people take much labor to do this. You probably pick and shovel. You get out there and rather than having a slope, you would terrace it. In other words, there would be areas where it's relatively flat. How much work you would have to do to do that is quite remarkable. To get what, a few feet more of grain. Only extreme hunger would push you into doing this. Obviously, there's a lot of people, and obviously, they they're need more land. The agricultural techniques available in the Middle Ages, though they are improvement of what had gone on before, are literally very weak compared to what you and I are doing today. On the look, let's look at France for example. On exactly the same acre in France today, as was the acre that was used in the Middle Ages, we are producing about four times as much wheat, higher yields per acre. So there's still, relatively speaking, low yields in the Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah, you're awash with people, but you do hit a level at which, using your agricultural techniques and the amount of land that's available, the, how much you can actually produce. A few diseases, well, uh, remember one author was saying, ah, oh, there's really no diseases. Well, there's diseases. We've talked about smallpox. One of your big problems, of course, are going to be hygiene. Um, can we say, how, however, if you want to compare this to the Black Death, in reality, yeah, there's two diseases. But uh, there are still problems. Nonetheless, the population continues to grow. And that's what I'm talking about right here. Overpopulation. More people than the resources will sustain. The environment is exploited. I talked about cutting down the forests. Use the forest for building materials. You need the land to grow grain. And you also need them as building materials. When they are building some of the Gothic cathedrals, you have to have support timbers that are quite large. And in many respects, they cannot get them in Europe. They have to send as far away as far away as Russia to get them. Obviously, the, the great forests are gone. Well, environment exploited, technology limited. Well, then we get hit with a major problem. Now the weather decides to go cooler. Quite frankly, it decides to go colder. I've got this down as a weather disaster. Clearly that is the case. It is much colder now than in the medieval warm period. Um, geologists will tell us, looking at the evidence we have in advancing glaciers and retreating glaciers, um, there is a way you can tell how hot it is. Um, see, archaeologists can go into soil samples. And you can go down to the appropriate level 800 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. And you can examine the soil that was made at that time frame. By the spores that are in the soil, you can tell what kind of plants were around. So if you have... Warm weather plants, it was warm at that time frame. Cold weather plants, it's colder at that time frame. So you do get an indication by examining the soil as to what the weather was like. Now we have other, other historical records that verify this. But in examining the soils, we find out that it's warm in the in medieval warm period. It's colder before that time frame, it's colder afterwards. The geologist will tell us that in Europe there's roughly a 1500 to 1600 year weather cycle, where it goes from cold to warm to cold again. Why would this be? Uh, remember when I was in grade school, teacher says the sun gives out a consistent amount of energy. So when I got in grad school, I was shocked to find out that that, is, that might not always be true. Well, the simple answer is we don't know why. But uh, let's look at uh, just a couple of the theories. <clears throat> the sun has less energy. Is there a cycle in the sun in which, as it produces energy, there's times when it produces more, there's times when it produces less. 
Obviously, the major heat source in the world by far is the sun. And if there's a change in the amount of, amount of heat that's coming out, that's going to make a big difference. Well, sun has less energy? Possibly. Uh, something happens. Now, sunspots aren't really discovered until we get the telescope. Galileo discovered them, I believe it was the year 1610. And that's when he starts taking his astronomical telescope and looking around. He sees the moon, he sees Jupiter. Um, he doesn't look directly at the sun, obviously that would totally blitz your eyes out. So he put the, he aimed the telescope on the sun and the light came through and hit on a piece of paper. So he get an idea of what the sun looked like by looking at the piece of paper. And he discovers sunspots. He's not the only person to observe the use of astronomical telescope. So other people, even after he's dead, uh, are looking at the sun. And then a few decades later, um, the sunspots disappear. They don't see them anymore. Uh, we call this the Moundar minimum, Moundar minimum, we should say it right. Uh, roughly, what's that? 60 years? And no sunspots. Um, okay. Then after 1715, the sunspots, sunspots reappear. And as you well know, there's a sunspot cycle. And it was about 11 years. And the sunspots have been observed ever since then. However, in the Moundar minimum, Moundar minimum, there are no sunspots. At exactly the same time, we say this is when the cold, sometimes we call this the little ice age, the cold becomes the most severe. During the Moundar minimum, we find that uh, along the coasts of France and England, uh, the harbors freeze over in the wintertime, every winter. The canals in Holland freeze over every winter. Uh, I don't know how often this happens anymore, back 40, 50 years ago. They were saying that they freeze over about once every 20 years. You just simply have to have that call of the winter. At this time frame, they freeze over all the time. Uh, so we have good indication. That the glaciers are advancing. We have good indication. It's very cold this time frame. Is there a connection between the sunspots? Maybe. Uh, it's very doubtful that this is somehow accidental. Uh, another theory, that Earth changed its orbit. Really? You, you see, we have some large planets, Jupiter. And Jupiter's, you know, a dot out there, it's a long ways out. But the argument is that there's pull on this, that the gravity of the of Jupiter would pull on the Earth in every Earth orbit. And over time, it could pull it out a ways. In other words, our orbit could become a little bit larger. If we're just a smaller distance away from the Sun, in reality, you would probably have a, uh, a colder atmosphere, a uh, colder time. Well, my problem with this is, and I'm not an astronomer, so I'm way out, out on a limb in this case. What would cause it to get warmer and what would cause it to go back? If Jupiter's pulling out, how would Jupiter end up pushing it back in 800 years? Uh, once again, I, I, I don't know. But I have heard that as a theory. Volcanic activity. Or was there just more volcanoes around the world? And they put more pumice in the air, which blocks in the sun, and make things colder, I guess. I guess it's a possibility. Um, whatever the cause is, it is fairly regular. Now, let's play historian a little bit better. If the medieval warm period is like 800 AD to 1300 AD, um, you have to have a cold cycle as well. Well, we go into a cold cycle after the medieval warm period. How about before that time? Is it cold as well? If you want to read this, you can say, oh, by the way, in the, late, in the late Roman time frame, when the Germanic tribes are up there and they go, you know, it's time to get out of town. Let's go down to warmer climates. Is it just being colder in the areas north of the Rhine and Danube? Let's go down and get to warmer places. If it's colder up north, could that help us understand the migration of these nations? It, it certainly could. The expansion of Rome would have been in the warmer time frame. And maybe this is much to their advantage. Um, I don't know how far to push this, but I also do not want to dismiss it. Whatever the reasons, it has been warm, and now it becomes cold. In 1306, I'm not saying there hasn't been a cold snap in the 13th century, but can we say in 1306, 
we see the first really cold winter in a lot of places in 300 years, going way back. And we now say the little ice age begins. So one thing about having a cold winter, which can be very uncomfortable and <clears throat> it could hurt your grain and you, you hurt your cattle, those kind of things. But when you have a series of these, it becomes more and more devastating. And we do say that is about the time when the little ice age begins. Uh, at this time frame, we start seeing these enormous storms coming off the North Sea, which nobody has seen in centuries. And in the case of Holland, sometimes these storms come in, they bat batter down the dikes, the polders, they batter down the dikes and flood areas, which had been, uh, water had been removed from that many years before, and uh, thousands drown. Um, then we have, some people call this the Great Famine, probably fits. We read in the Chronicles about a several year period. It rains. Rather than having a rain and go away, it rains. It rains. It, 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 well, it rains all summer. That can be devastating. 13, 15, it rains. Well, what happens? The, you put the grain in the field, it gets flooded. You put the grain in the field, it doesn't ripen properly. When you do bring the grain out, there's too much water in it, so it tends to have mold. Uh, you have less grain. Um, you, if you've been feeding the grain to the cattle, and, and then the cattle don't, don't have enough food. And if they've been out foraging, eating grass, uh, the cattle don't give enough, enough of that either. They sicken and they die. That's extremely painful. When you put these kinds of years in a row, 1315, 1360, 1317, you can see how this can build up, how this can end up being an extremely challenging scenario. Then we get to 1322. Some historians reading the Chronicles I will say this is the very, very bad time. In 1322, some, his, some historians say that it doesn't really get better. It gets somewhat better. So you could actually take this, rather than going to 1317, you could take it all the way to 1322. Um, this, is, this is absolutely devastating. Uh, let me pick on the year 1315. Um, as you know, I'm interested in medieval Swiss history. In 1315, uh, the Austrians, with their German allies, decided to invade Schwyz in the central part of Switzerland. And uh, as we read the Chronicles, they come there with ropes. And the ropes, what they're going to do, is going to take the ropes, they're going to go get the cattle. In other words, they're going to plunder uh, the areas of central Switzerland for their food resources. They want their grain, they want their cattle. Uh, this is very important in Swiss history because the Swiss figure out a way to ambush them and throw rocks on them and come down with their battle axe and cut them up. November 1315. Maybe one of the reasons why the Habsburgs, the Austrians, take this political decision was for economic reasons as well. You do need more food. And one way you can get it is by plundering your enemies. Of course, this is commonly done in the Middle Ages. Uh, we like to read about battles. Battles are important in Napoleonics. Battles are important in World War II. We read about battles. In the, in the Middle Ages, battles did happen. They're relatively rare. Most of what we see are, sh are skirmishes. What you do when you go to war with some, another nation, you go in and pillage and plunder and take things. So even if you weren't desperate for food, um, you would not be surprised if people came in and stole some food. Anyway, well, who st well the peasants starve. Uh, their resources are relatively limited. Um, very often in a famine, you have a famine in one place, but there's other places nearby that, in effect, will have food. So you can buy it if you can afford it. You can get it from someplace else. When you have this general problem in many areas of Europe, with extensive rain, then where do you go to buy grain? 
The nobles starve, the, excuse me, the peasants starve. The nobles, well, the nobles are relatively well off. They've got money. They've got granaries. So they suffer much less than the peasants do. In looking over this entire time frame, we would say roughly between 1300 and 1347, this is Europe, there'd be about 20 years of poor harvest, and in some cases, which you already talked about, devastatingly poor harvests. Um, as I'm playing with the weather, let me take this a little bit broader. The weather kind of goes screwy later in the century and into the 15th century, the next century, where you normally would think uh, spring would come at certain months, and if spring comes at certain months, you know what to do, you know when to plant. One of the ways you tell about spring, of course, is the weather. There are times when there's so much rain and snow that you actually end up, uh, can't plant until months later, sometimes May and June. Uh, of course, when you plant later, you tend, you tend to have a different uh, yield, a less yield. Uh, and there are years when it gets so warm, you plant earlier. See, rather than being largely consistent, it kind of goes screwy. And, and then we have things that you read, don't read about in other time frames. We have plagues of locusts striking France. Locusts? Now, you, we usually talk about plagues of locusts. I mean, there are insects in France, obviously, and they can be a problem if you have a lot of them. But uh, usually talk about insects down in Africa and the Sahel, various areas of Africa. It can be absolutely devastating. You have large numbers of these little critters, and they, they, they'll eat, eat, you, eat everything you've got. That's down in Africa. For them to end up in France, you probably had a lot of locusts in northern Africa. They would actually blow into France, and obviously this is fed by a certain amount of rainfall and wind patterns and, and temperatures. But when you have a plague of locusts striking you, they're going to eat up a lot of your crops as well. So yes, I'm talking about the buildup here to the mid-century, but this is not the only problems we are facing. Um, can we say at time frames when you have less food, violence goes up because people want more food. They, they're willing to rob, steal, and get it. Uh, as I've already was speculating about 1315, you got people going to war for more food. And then you get war. I've mentioned this in a couple of contexts already. Let me mention it again. The Hundred Years' War starts in 1337. Now you have English armies coming into France over and over and over again. Largely because of the English longbow, you have the inability of the French to actually defend themselves. Even large mounts, large numbers of mounted knights, later on wearing plate armor. Uh, and you can't still still deal with these, with these armies. <clears throat> and going back to the idea that a lot of times in the Middle Ages, um, armies were not fighting as many battles. They're fighting for resources. Because it was so hard to stop the English, <clears throat> the English went on what they call a chevache. Uh, this is a big raid. Uh, do I have a map for you, for you here? Maybe I don't. Let's see. There's a man by the name of the Black, Black Prince. <laughs> Jeep Cherokee, okay. Uh, he is the son of the King of England, son of Edward III. Yeah, he's famous for wearing duh, black armor. Well, My French is lousy to see if that's even close to the right spelling. Okay, uh, we have a number of these. Uh, this is not the grand one, but notice you have the English, and the English are operating in southern France. Um, with very little opposition, uh, these guys are able to raid. You get you know, a lot of guys on horseback, got to have archers there as well, and you simply pillage, plunder, and burn in large sections of France. 
There's another example of other chevauchés. Uh, the English grabbed Calais, a city in eastern France. They held it until about 1557, 1558. Uh, so they held this for several centuries. And you can start out with a raid down here. You come here and you can raid through northern France. Over here in western France as well. So there's a number of these. The Grand Chevauché so it actually starts up in here and it sweeps literally all the way through France. You're taking the most populous country in the world, in, in Europe, I should say, in Europe, and doing severe damage to it. This is obviously uh, something that advances to tell you where the fighting is taking place in the <clears throat> Hundred Years' War. And that's kind of interesting. Unfortunately, we don't have time to simply play with that. Okay. A violence war. The population has got to be going to decline. Too much war, too much pest, too much bad harvest. What some historians are still going to argue. Of course, there's going to be a population decline. How do we properly graph this? Population has to be going down. So let's say around 1300, your population level is this. By 1350, your population is down like this. What is hard to decide is how severe is the decline. Does the decline start here and you get to the Black Death and it goes bonk? Or do you actually have the decline being relatively modest and you get the Black Death and then it falls off? In either scenario, we're having a large numbers of people die. Can we say the population surviving? Population is weakened because of lack of food. And then, can we say, Europe needs a break. You need peace. Um, you need better weather. Rather than getting a break, it gets one of the worst economic disasters. Economic, the worst disasters in the entire history of Europe. And that is the Black Death. We call it the plague. Call it the pestilence. Um, those of you who read the first paragraph of my article, I, I actually um, gave you an indication so I can get a map here. Get an indication of when it came in. But really the thrust of my article was not so much dealing with the Black Death as it was with its impact on the mentality of people in Switzerland that led them to attack. Is this a good map? That led them to attack Jews. Um, it, it, it comes in. And uh, we first hear about it at Odessa. And what happened is there's laying a siege to a city. Uh, the plague hits this besieging force. <clears throat> when they leave, they, they, they of course, they, they can't stay there. They're all dying. Uh, so you put a corpse on a catapult and shoot the corpse into the city. Well, this probably wouldn't have made much difference. But they did believe that the, that the plague could be transmitted. Um, the plague got into Odessa. Following the trade routes, can you see it right here? Following the trade routes to Constantinople, Eastern Mediterranean, by 1347, it is now in a, some areas in Italy. So look at this map. 1348 is kind of the next shot. Um, in the first six months of 1348, it has expanded about halfway into France. By the end of the year, it's virtually all the way through France. Now. England knew it was coming. One of the fascinating aspects of, of the plague itself is that information traveled faster than the plague traveled. So uh, you know it's coming. Well, what do you do? Remember, in Germany and in Switzerland, you kill Jews. Uh, it arrives anyway. Obviously, that was not the cause. In the, but there are virtually no Jews in, in England. They'd already driven them out. So they don't have them to blame. What they try to do is close their ports. And in closing their ports, they don't allow anything to come in from the continents. And uh, they say, well, if it, if there's no way for it to get in. However, 
it does get in. And 1349, it is also into England. There are a few areas. This map is a little bit misleading right here in Bohemia. There's a couple of cities in Germany where it doesn't really strike. Um, the city of Milan it doesn't strike there as well. Um, sometimes extreme measures could pay off. Uh, when in the city of Milan in northern Italy, when the plague started to appear and a few people get it, uh, they actually wouldn't even take these people out and kill them. They'd simply wall them up in their, in their houses. Of course, they would die in there. Many years later, I guess you have to go in and clean out. <clears throat> a pretty awful scenario. But in any event, they were able to keep the plague from actually advancing by extreme measures. There's an Italian by the name of Boccaccio, Giovanni Boccaccio. And you can see his years right here. Obviously, the plague, the biggest year of the plague in Italy is 1348. Um, if you want to use just one year and use this, the sweep of the plague as one year in Europe, you would choose 1348. Though, as you can see, depending where you're at, it can vary quite considerably. If you think of Europe, uh, the heart of Europe being Italy and France, yes, 1348 is your number. Any event, 1348, he's in Italy. Uh, he he uh, uh, wrote years later, a book called the Decameron. Uh, this is some good Renaissance literature. The Decameron is um, a story about people and they're getting out of the plague. They're running away. Uh, wealthy people can do this. You know, they can go to a castle on a hill. So the nobility is hurt less by the plague than would be the case of people of other, of, shall we say, poorer levels. And, well, what are you going to do if you're up in the castles with the doors locked? Well, why don't you do this? Let's just sit around and tell stories. An art form which you and I kind of forget. My grandma's time frame, my parents' time frame. One of the ways you entertain your kids is you get those, you tell those kids stories about how you were growing up. You get connected more to your parents and grandparents. When I was growing up, you put your kids in front of the television set. Nowadays, I put my kids in front of computer games, and uh, you're entertained in a lot of different ways. But people talk back then. This is not to be surprised. Not surprising at all. And Boccaccio recounts the stories what these people are telling. That is a number of short stories, and it's brilliant Italian literature. Now, but he's an eyewitness. Before he gets into his story, he has to tell why these people are hiding out. He is a contemporaneous, he is an eyewitness. In his introduction, which is saying why these people are up and hiding out, he gives a description of the plague. How it comes in, how people die, how people die in large numbers, um, how it sweeps through communities. This is a classic account. Now, there are others. There are many others. This is not our only source. But if you're interested in a very good description by an eyewitness, read the introduction to the camera. Um, it sweeps through. It's horrible. It's devastating. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, it's bad enough that it comes at all, but it never really leaves after it has come. What you see is this. It returns every summer. It returns in the Italian cities every summer. Yeah, relatively speaking, fall, winter, spring. It's not too bad. It's colder. But in the summer, in the cities, you will find the plague coming back. Um, once again, you're poor people. You can't go anywhere. And you suffer high, high death rates. Uh, once again, if you're wealthy, you go in the mountains, go in the hills, where it's cooler and you have less problem with plague. I'm not saying there is nobody that ever, no noble that ever gets gets killed because the wife of the king of Bohemia actually got the plague and died. One of the daughters of Edward III of England, who is going down to marry a prince in Spain, she contracts the disease and dies. But it's abundantly clear, however, that the death rates among the nobility is not nearly as high as it is among the peasantry, the lower classes. So it returns every summer. 
for whatever reason, we read about battles, we read about men, bodies laying dead in the fields. Uh, the plague comes back then as well. Did they feed off the uh, bodies? I don't know. It seems like every generation, the plague comes back in a stronger form. Now, the largest number of peoples that were killed, the largest percentage of society, was actually in the first wave, the first time it came through. But in 1360, another major wave sweeps through Europe. And in this case, uh, fewer percentage people die, but it's still very devastating. And some contemporary observers say this is even a stronger, more virulent form of the plague than had been the case earlier. It literally comes back for centuries. Uh, really until the 18th century. The major outbreak of the plague in France is like 1711. The last major outbreak in London, in, in England, is actually 1665. So it takes a long time before it dies out. Virtually every generation has to face a major outbreak, and every generation in every year is going to have to be aware of it's a problem in various places. We said influence the entire era. There is a uh, can this affect your mentality? Let's stop, hop up 150 years after the time frame of this course, after 1500. And we get the Protestant Reformation. We have people thinking religion differently and coming up with different religions. Well, one of the things in the back of people's mind is, you know, let's get religion right. Because we want to get religion right because death is right around the corner. The idea of and you can live a while if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, you die very young. You might want to get right with your with your maker before this happens. Um, also, when we're talking about the Renaissance in Italy, which starts about the time from the Black Death arrives, and they're also thinking in terms of getting right with the Lord. And we see in their art a reflection of the church paying artists money to present information and for religious themes. Uh, can we say it influences people's mentality? Absolutely. Influences literature? Yes, it does. Well, what is it? It's the bubonic plague. Do you like terms? <laughs> Let's see if I can read that correctly. You're seeing the pestis? All right. Uh, you, you, uh, people studying medicine or going to be studying medicine might want to remember these names. Um, uh, I've been following this for decades. It's been an interest of mine for a long time. And I'm trying to follow various arguments. There was a time where I think some historians had very good arguments that maybe it was not the Black Death at all. That there are other diseases that have similar, like anthrax, uh, that spread about the same way, about the same rapidity. In other words, rather than following trade routes, you can say that they were actually following the weather patterns in other words, the winds tend to blow in this direction through Europe. I think they had a very good case. However, there are a lot of corpses that have been found where people died of the plague. And let's examine their corpses and found out the DNA within their teeth uh, confirmed that it was, in fact, Black Death. So the theories that it was anthrax or something else at this point, I think, uh, lack some merit. In, in fact, they're probably incorrect. Well, there's two forms. I know you're aware of one. One is when you have the rat. And the rat lives nearby, and these little fleas, man, they loved it. <laughs> eat rat blood. And they eat rat blood. And they got disease among rats. And then with the flea, after a while, uh, when the rat dies, there's nothing else to drink. So he hops around, hops onto people, and he takes a nice little bite out of you. And he takes the disease, therefore, from the rat into the human being. That is a killer. Not everybody dies. Um, there's another form. We call it the pneumonic plague. The pneumonic plague, for whatever reason, when you do get the bacillus inside of you, the black death, sometimes it goes into your lungs. And when it goes into your lungs, it, your lungs get inflamed and it 
destroys your lung tissue and you start coughing out blood. There are instances where people seem to be fairly healthy, walking down the street, lean over, start coughing, they coughing up blood and literally die on the spot because they can no longer breathe. This can literally knock you down at any time. The mortality rate on that has been calculated as something like 90%. Some recent studies have talked about, well, who died and who, who didn't die. There are people that die from the plague. There are people that get the plague and don't die. And then there's people that don't get the plague at all. That's probably the best of all scenarios. Um, what's the difference between a person who gets the plague and dies and gets the plague and lives? Well, I have the mortality rate for the pneumonic plague be about 90%. Um, if you get it from the flea, your death rates were more like two-thirds. Uh, and uh, historians have argued, taking a look at people's DNA, say, oh, by the way, uh, if you have one gene, uh, you'll get the plague and live. If you have both genes, you won't get the plague at all. If you have two genes, if you have, if you have, oh, I've said that wrong, one gene, you get the plague and live. Two genes, you don't get it all. Uh, no genes, you, you die. Um, there's been another argument, which I think is a little bit silly, where they say there are people that can be exposed to AIDS and they don't get it. In fact, you can demonstrate that they're within within the person's body. And after a while, it goes. I mean, AIDS is very, very dangerous. AIDS, AIDS, AIDS will kill you. And then they find that some people just they don't have it anymore. I go, whoa, uh, that's quite remarkable. And then they were saying, oh, by the way, the people that survived the Black Death uh, will, are those kind of people that will actually have, their ancestors, will actually have resistance to AIDS. I'm going, um, I want to see you prove that. And genealogy is very, very hard to trace people back that far. And so how do we actually know, going back to the 14th century, what your family tree is like and where you can trace a gene? I, I think it's interesting. It's curious. But on the other hand, um, I, I, I'm skeptical. I don't think they've got the, enough evidence to actually prove that. Okay, huge mortality rates, absolutely. The estimates do vary. The one we see most commonly is one-third of all of Europe dies. Well, you can read other books. And some will say 50%. Uh, some will say 20%. We don't have the population information as much as we would like. We call population stage demography. Demographers have, however, been able to use the records in England. England has some of the best records from the Middle Ages. Almost historians from almost every country would literally hold their breath and turn purple to try to have the kind of sources in their countries as you have in England. At the beginning of the plague, we believed that there were about 4 million people in England. At the end of the plague, we have very good reason to believe there's about 2.5 million people in England. So that's one third. That, that fits relatively nicely. <clears throat> well, I mentioned earlier, kind of in passing, there were a few areas that were not initially hit by the plague. That's the first round. The plague came and got them later. There's no place that actually escaped, at least for a lengthy period of time. <clears throat> well, dem demographic records, population records, can we say are stronger in cities? That uh, in places like Florence, and remember Boccaccio was a Florentine, so his eyewitness accounts would help us understand what's happening in Florence. As we look at such issues as wills and taxation records, and we look in cities, we find that in the case of Florence, about two-thirds of the people there died. Oh, big, big loss. Um, these are estimates I've seen. I'm still conservative. I still think one-third is correct. But I've seen from 20 to 80 percent of the populations die in many cases. A recent study, which I found very exciting when I found out about it, I had gotten by the book really fast. And, and historians in London have taken a little bit different, different approach. Uh, 
they look at wills, probates. They look at documents that tell us about when people are dying. And they look at the number of wills coming out. And we find that in 1349, there's a clear spike. In other words, the number of wills, the number of, of documents related to people's deaths go up dramatically. In dating these documents, they have to put a date on any official document. In dating these documents, looking at the dates and carefully analyzing the material, the historians have been able to argue that 60% of all the people in London died in a nine-month period in 1349. The evidence for a disaster is absolutely overwhelming. Going back to this, I keep on mentioning this. The peasants are devastated. The loss of peasant, the peasant community is huge. Um, going back to the freeing of society, remember I talked about this later, earlier, there's people that want to uh, bid up their services and you get more money, you get better treatment, and you get more rights when you have fewer peasants. Uh, this is a bad way to get your rights, to have people die, but there is some good we can say that might come of this. So the peasants are devastated, the nobles suffer relatively little, and as I've already mentioned, the nobles can run and can hide. Uh, the lesser clergy is hurt badly. This is the parish priest. Uh, this is the man who has a fine reputation. He, he's out there and he holds your hand when you're sick. And um, he and the nuns, the Sisters of Mercy, uh, they get out and they help people. And, uh, you know, they tend the baby when you're sick and they bring you food. And, you know, I, mean, I mean, they bring you spiritual comfort. You, you, your loved one is in a nicer place. Well, uh, what's the evidence that the lesser clergy was hurt badly? Well, we can say because they are largely from the peasant community that within that social matrix that they would suffer heavily. Yeah, we can make that, that uh, observation. Uh, there are times in monasteries, for example, uh, there's what a monastery in Ireland where uh, they believe there's like 27 monks there. And there was a writing there and the monks said, oh, by the way, everybody's dead but me. And then the next line is in another hand, in other words, handwriting, because that man obviously died as well. He's not around to make the next notation. We believe they were hurt badly. Um, if you have means, can you run and hide? Uh, can, can these priests maybe get into a castle with the bishops? Um, do they have that opportunity to try to escape what's happening? A good priest knows that he is going to have to be close to these people. There's something called extreme unction. You should have your final confessional to a priest before you die. And you should also have uh, words said over you, a benediction from the priest to help you go in the next life. This has to be done. Are there priests that would shirk this responsibility? Probably. Those who do not shirk the responsibility. Can we say these are the best ones? If you go out and talk to people, help people that are dying, are you going to get, catch this and die as well? Very likely. Going back to Boccaccio and some other accounts, we do read about people that abandoned their children to die. If something comes to the household, if I stay with my kids, they'll die. Leave them as though they were strangers. I wouldn't call that good parent parenting, but maybe you have a chance to save your life that way. Can we argue? This is impossible to prove, but let's look at the possibility. Is it possible that the church lost its best people? Is it possible the good parish priests went out, did their duty, and died? While the other, shall we say, less good priests did not die. Does the church lose the best people? Possibly. Now, but we see something after the Black Death, which we haven't seen as much before. Uh, remember, the most respected people in France are the priests and nuns. 
in France and many other countries as well, are the priests and the nuns. And uh, but later on, we see all the after the Black Death, we see all these criticisms. You know, the high life, these the priests. The, you know, uh, remember the uh, Canterbury Tales. I mean, Chaucer was writing about this, and there was a Franciscan monk with them, and he's a dirty old man. He's a Franciscan. This is one of the more moral of all of the religious orders in Catholicism, and he just chases little girls. I go, well, that's a criticism. Uh, later on, actually within the same century, when Chaucer was writing these things, we get a group of people called the Lollards. This is also in England. And in the Lollards, uh, uh, they're anti-clerical. They don't like the fact that a priest uh, can help you or help you get into the next life. Um, well, why do you hate the priest so, uh, so bad? And they say we want scripture to get into the to the uh, be available to people, so they translate the Bible into Middle English. Uh, and some, in some respects, we call this a pre-Reformation movement. Now there are others. We're going to see one that's going to map over here over in Bohemia. We're going to call them the Hussites, and the Hussites actually have a connection with the Lollards, John Wycliffe primarily up in England. And they bring the same ideas here. But look at this. These kinds of things were not around before the Black Death. Is it possible that in losing good priests, that now we have people criticizing the church? It's entirely possible. It's an interesting point of discussion. Well, the social, cultural, and mental impact. Let's give you some uh, some examples of what's happening here. The dance of death is an image. And we have a number of good artists in Italy. Uh, sometimes we say these people are working toward what we later call Renaissance art. They die in the death, they die in the Black Death. 1348, we lose very good artists in Italy. Well, what is art like in the next generation after that? Uh, some art historians call us retardataire, and others retarded, and it was backwards. Rather than making progress artistically, it's going backwards. And uh, these are some of the medieval motifs we see. It always gets me because the, the death, these skeletons, they're, <laughs> they're having a great time. Um, my idea of death is, shall we say, a little bit different than that. Um, death stalks everybody. Here is, I guess that's a merchant uh, carrying his goods and services, and the death comes and gets him. The death is grabbing this churchman in this case. Death is grabbing, let's get her up here. I'm not sure who she is. Sometimes as you look through these things, you even find people of higher social status uh, where death is around you. Uh, negative mentality, you know, things are bad, certainly. I'd like to show you some others here. Got the map up. I'm looking for his Black Death. Art. Okay, we've got the Dance of Death. Let's get some more images up here. The one I actually wanted to show you is a fresco. And that's not it. But anyway, we have people making caskets. Can we say this art form is not as advanced as it was before the Black Death? That's why it's retarded to a certain extent. Um, there is one where they actually show large numbers of people carrying caskets to graveyards. My luck is not with me. I'm not seeing this easily. But uh, try it one other time and give up. Uh, we're making the caskets. 
I've never seen that one before. It's kind of gross. Well, I'm not seeing the one one I want, but uh, suffice it to say, I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, we can say, and a lot of historians do say this, that the Renaissance actually starts around 1350, after the Black Death. Well, and there are two major aspects to this. This is literature and this is also art. And uh, however, the art aspect doesn't really start picking up again until around 1400, where you start to advance art again. Okay, death present, deaths of death, people are really quite concerned about this. In an age of fear, desire to get religion right, I've already mentioned that, there's a big impact on the Reformation. No explanation, carried by the air, God's punishment, talked about that a little bit in the article I had you read, out to get you. It's fascinating to, to take a look at what happens to people during times of crisis. You do find people that are religiously oriented, well, they're going to go down to Mass. They're going to go down and be on their knees praying, Lord save us. And there's people saying, well, this is the last time to have a good time. So let's get your girlfriend, uh, let's go down to the bar and say, line them up. I'm drinking them all down. We see both these kind of things happening. In talking about an extreme form of the how this strikes people mentally, it is impossible to overlook the flagellants. These are people that say, we are being punished by God. If God did not want this to happen, he would not have allowed it to happen, or he would not have sent it to happen. And in doing that kind of thing, we simply have to repent of our sins. But why don't we punish ourselves so Lord in his infinite mercy and understanding will not punish us as well? Groups of these people, sometimes they go from town to town, to village to village. Uh, flagellants, they whip themselves, among other things. They do bad things to themselves. They get pieces of metal and, and cut themselves. They cut their genitals. Uh, they whip themselves, sometimes ferociously. And of course, a lot of people are saying, what are these kooks doing out here? But a lot of people come out and say, gee, I'm glad they're doing it, not so I don't have to. But you could see the extreme mentality involved in these people willing to take extreme measures to try even the point of torturing themselves. And sometimes our accounts of these tortures are so extreme that you think these people are actually killing themselves. Only extreme fear would cause this. Well, I would love to tell you about many other uh, items, many a lot of more materials. Uh, had I burned through this a little bit better, I could tell you a little bit more about the Renaissance, which is fascinating. One of the best things I could do about the Renaissance is, look down here, is art. And literature, so I could have big discussions on Renaissance uh, art, architecture, art, sculpture, that kind of thing. Unfortunately, I can't talk about any, anything, everything in a, in a short class. I have enjoyed teaching you this class. I've enjoyed the interaction we used to have while I could still talk to you personally. Um, you're very good students. Uh, your papers were very impressive. And I, uh, overall, your, your examination is very good as well. So let's just put a very good picture on this. Uh, you're done. Finish out the semester. Uh, get your grade. And hopefully everything will improve. And if you decide to take another class from me another time, hopefully we'll be able to meet in person. In the meantime, I appreciate you. and hope everything's going very well. I'll talk to you again another time.